Members of the City Council, please attend the call meeting of the City Council to be held in the 6th Floor Conference Room, 801 Crawford Street, 5 p.m. Tuesday, May 26, 2015, for the purpose of a public work session. In addition, you may consider a motion to go into closed meeting by order of the Mayor. Mr. Cherry? Here. Dr. Edmonds? Mr. Meeks? Mr. Moody? Ms. Simmons? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Was it? Mayor Wright? Yes, here. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Good evening. Madam Vice Mayor, members of council. I'm going to ask Wanda Gill, our Director of Parks, Recreation, and Leisure Services, to come to the podium. Um, and while she comes up, just uh, introduce um, this item. Uh, this is uh, a recommendation that's coming forward from the Parks and Recreation Commission, and it is in regard to the naming of that facility that we have all conveniently referred to as a pond. <coughs> But we really need to Which get we away. Which we should from, stop. Yes, we need, to get, we need to get away from that nomenclature. And, and so uh, they've studied the matter and, and came up with a recommendation, and uh, she's bringing that forward to you today. Okay, very good. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor Sherry, Honorable Council. How are you all doing? Well, I'm so happy to report that we finally have a, a recommendation for a name, which is <laughs> the Portsmouth Community Cultural and Sports Complex for your review and approval tonight. Um, the Rec Commission got together along with the Advisory Commission and spoke to the community, had a lot of feedback from stakeholders all over. So that is the recommendation, and I want to present that to you tonight. Okay. How did we come up with that? We met with the, the Portsmouth Recreation uh, Commission, Recreation Commission, and also the Advisory Commission. All of them met together and you know, kind of went back and forth with names, and also members of the community provided suggestions, emailed, called, and gave them their, their okay, so, suggestions. So they tried so we to got the community an opportunity to weigh in. Okay. Yes, sir. And the name again? It's Portsmouth Community Cultural and Sports Complex. Okay. And we like to abbreviate everything. So <laughs> what are we going to call it? Portsmouth Sports Complex. Okay. Oh, Portsmouth Recreation Complex. <laughs> okay. All right. And that's just for information tonight, or do you want... Some We'd like your, your, your blessing on that. This is... Um, you know, we, I like we, 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 we do, uh, yeah, and, and we recognize it's going to take some time to think can we, about. Can we wait till next meeting? You okay with it? Y'all okay with it? If you're involved in community and gave them a chance, then I, 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 yes, I, I'll be okay with it as well. But uh, I just I want to make sure that the, cult, the community cultural that comes before sports. That's right. So they wanted to make sure it incorporates a lot of different yeah. things, not just the recreation component, but the community cultural. I hope I don't have to answer the telephone there. That's and the only one. That's going to be a log. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, you have a majority that says yes. So we'll, uh, do we need to make some type of official vote tonight. The council meeting, maybe we can bring you up to the podium and you can address it in front of the, uh, uh, the viewing audience there so everybody at home will know what the new name is and, and how we'll go forth. Yes, sir. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, before you leave, uh, just if you would just give uh, us a quick update on the activities that have started at the complex yes, and sir. Uh, facilities that are open. Yes, sir. On May the 4th, we moved the senior program from the Clifton Road site to Portsmouth Complex. So we're averaging a, between 125 and 150 seniors a day. Good. Today, when we went in for a meeting with the health department, we had them doing the choir rehearsal so we could barely hear in the conference room with the singing. So we have uh, driving classes there. Um, we have the weight room there is already installed, so they're using the fitness equipment. We've been doing classes, um, AERP driving, cooking classes, the feeding program, uh, Bible study. We have a library. The computer lab is set up. So all of that is in place right now. Okay. And next month, we will have the gym open about the middle or the end of June. The gym will open up for the summer do summer programs, summer activities, basketball for the kids, tennis, all of that will be open in June. The, the gym? Yes, sir. What about the pool? The pool um, is actually ready. We had a problem with the chemicals yesterday, which we're resolving right now. The mm -hmm. second inspection is Wednesday, so we're hoping to have that resolved then. So we'll be open on Saturday and Sunday from 1230 until 430. And all, both pools and the splash park will be open from 1230 to 430 until June the 21st. And then June 22nd, we go into our full-time summer schedule. June 22nd. And we're hoping to have the gymnasium open as well around that time. So yes, it's all wide open. Okay. Just so you know, last, yesterday at the Splash Park, we had 174 kids and almost 300 people at the train. 
at all since we had a lot of participation. That's, that's so. good news. Great news. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Any all questions right. for Dr. Gill? All right. And sure. before you take your seat, I want to let you all all know that I was over at Hampton for the uh, uh, Human Affairs the Office of Human Affairs uh, annual meeting and our Parks and Recreation Department was uh, identified and got an award for the Corporate Citizen of the Year. The Corporate Citizen of the Year and so that was great wow. news. I mean they do a lot of recognizing uh, different localities and organizations that do things that impact young people in our community and I think uh, there was a nice clip that we put together and showed about the new rec center and some of the other things that we're doing here in Portsmouth for our young people so, so that was it was a proud moment program. it was a proud moment for your mayor so, yes it was thank job. you All our right, Head Start you. program we have one at Cavalier Manor one at J.E. Parker and um, we're going to also open one at the Portsmouth Complex. So right now we have 150 kids in that program. Okay. Yeah, last week was the 50th anniversary of Head Start. I actually visited the J.E. Parker Center on the actual anniversary date awesome. and uh, uh, spent about an hour over there. And Thank you for that. Yes, it was. And uh, um, now we've got, what you said, about 150? 150 Could children. Okay. Between right. JFK, Cavalier Manor, and J.E. Parker. And J. E. Three Parker. sites. Yes, sir. And those are three to five three year olds. Three to five year olds. That's yes, sir. correct. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you, sir. Very good. Your next item is uh, a follow up on uh, an item that you deferred from your council meeting two weeks ago. And let me ask Meg Pittenger, our environmental manager, to come forth. Um, you'll recall that we had this item on for a first reading at your um, May 12th agenda. Uh, the, um, the director of the Tidewater Builders Association had sent a letter and came to the meeting and had some concern about a couple of elements in that. You deferred action on it and asked us to get with the Tidewater Builders Association, mm -hmm. uh, and we did. We met with them last week. Um, we talked about some revisions that uh, um, really are good <laughs> compromises in terms of uh, that will have um, the effect of reducing some of the cost for rebuilding in a, in a flooding situation and also not have a detrimental uh, impact on on premiums in the long run. So, um, Meg, if you would just, um, if, I think we have a one-page handout for you that sort of highlights oh my, what this changes my thunder. are. And, uh, <laughs> take it from there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Godfrey, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of council. As Mr. Godfrey said, we, um, after the uh, council meeting, at your last council meeting, uh, we set up a meeting with Josh Clark from the Tidewater Builders Association. He was gracious enough to change his schedule. He had a variety of meetings that day, come in and meet with Mr. Godfrey, Ms. Joseph, and myself. And Mr. Baldwin uh, came because Mr. Brusso was off. Uh, and we hammered out, we, we offered up three different options that we thought that would be workable. And at the end of the meeting, we, we all agreed, and, and Mr. Clark uh, came to an agreement of the option that you have on, on your handout there. Um, what we've done is, as you recall, there were some concerns about the, the definitions of substantial improvement and substantial damage. Um, as we talked about, we can't remove the from any cause from the damage piece because that's required in the federal regulations. But what we did was we added the phrase from flood damages. So for that 10-year period for substantial damage, the cumulative, we will only count that part that's flood damages. If it's a fire, tree falling on it, car running into it or whatever, we won't accumulate those damages. Um, what that means is that the ICC that we talked about for flood damages, if they get cumulative over a number of years, they'll be able to get that coverage. If we had taken that cumulative completely out, they would not have been able to get that cumulative over a number of years. Okay. Certainly if there's one flood event and they get 50% damage, they're still eligible for the ICC. But if we didn't have that cumulative and you get you know, d d uh, damage after damage after damage, we wouldn't be able to count that. And I talked to the FEMA representative in Philadelphia the day of the train wreck, um, and she confirmed, yeah, I said, first of all, you guys all okay? And she was like, yes. Um, but she confirmed that we could split it that way and we could keep that in and we would make our ordinance okay. Um, and then people would still be able to get the ICC. And we explained that to Josh, and he seemed to, Tidewater Builders Association seemed to be okay with that because certainly if there's repetitive flood things, you want to go ahead and, and elevate and, and bring the, the house into compliance with today's standards. Um, so that was the one change for the substantial damage. For substantial improvement, what we did is we took out the cumulative completely. Um, we feel 
certainly we feel like people would be safer if it was in there. But we feel like with the increases to the flood insurance premiums, people are going to get to the point that they're going to need to increase their, you know, their elevation or whatever on their own anyway, because the flood insurance premiums are going up. That's a federal thing. That's not anything that we can affect on a local level. That's happening no matter what. So what you have in the updated ordinance are those changes that you see in the handout there. And again, what that means is that for cumulative improvement, we won't be tracking those things that are not more than 50% in one event. If somebody's replacing a roof, siding, windows, any of those things, we won't be tracking those improvements on structures in the flood um, zones. We'll only be tracking if it's a one-time event, um, if they're gonna go and elevate the whole, you know, do improvements to the entire structure. And again, Mr. Clark was, was okay with that. That's in line with what they have in, in the other cities locally. Um, so we would like to recommend that um, council approve the first reading of the amended ordinance tonight. Because um, we deferred it last meeting. We didn't do the first reading, right? Correct. So you tonight will be the first, and we'll bring it back up the next yes, meeting sir. for final. Yes. Okay. So we would like to recommend that you approve the first reading. Okay. Uh, we, Mr. Godfrey invited Mr. Clark to come back and, and speak, so if he chooses, I don't see him yet, but but he may, he may come. And again, he was, you know, it was a relatively brief meeting, but we sort of got a pretty good meeting of the minds all, all pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he sent he, a letter. He sent, he sent us a letter Did he? Okay. recommending, endorsing your Excellent, excellent. Okay, good. okay. Thank very good. Question? Right. Thanks, Mick. Yes, please. <clears throat> um, the next item on the agenda is an item that's on your regular agenda tonight. It's the only, um, uh, new item on your agenda. It's in regard to realigning the classification of funding for fiscal year 15 for the schools. Um, and um, we have um, uh, Chairman Bridgeford here and uh, Chris Steele is here. Yeah, Dr. So, Bracey is here too. And Dr. Bracey is here. Good. Um, so we, uh, we had met with them um, last week or the week before. Week, and um, yes, it was earlier last week. You'll recall we, we had gotten a letter from um, uh, the chairman uh, following their May 7th meeting asking for realignment of, of the uh, expenditures. Uh, we didn't have time between that Friday morning receipt of the letter and the, you know, the agenda that was on the next Tuesday, which was May the 12th, to get it on that agenda. So we knew it was going to be on this agenda. Um, and then we met with them last week, and early last week they knew that they were going to ask for an additional realignment at their meeting on Thursday, uh, May 21st. And so we have that one as well. And so what you have before you is a, um, a combined uh, realignment of both the, uh, the May 7th request and the May uh, 21st request. Um, and um, let me ask Judy if she would sort of introduce it and then uh, we'll we would welcome the input from the schools as far as an explanation for how those expenditures are going to be made. Yeah, I, for purposes of tonight's vote, as Brandon said, we've combined the two resolutions into one ordinance for tonight. So the ordinance you'll be voting on will approve um, both the resolutions that they've submitted. As you, as you know, at the beginning of the fiscal year, they um, appropriate to certain categories their funding uh, based on what they think they're going to need now we're getting towards the end of the year mm -hmm. and they have some projects that they would like to um, put, buy or, or purchase out of certain ca other categories so they're requesting some adjustments so if you look at the ordinance there would be a decrease of the instruction line by six million six hundred ninety one thousand four hundred ninety five dollars and then the rest of the categories will have increases. There'll be a $50,000 increase to administration, attendance, and health, $110,000 to people transportation, operations and maintenance will have a $2,635,864. Um, the debt and fund transfer is an increase of $895,631, and the technology is an increase of $3 million. So, um, as you said, the, the first ordinance was for various projects that they'd like to do. The second ordinance was for them to pay off their debt to Amoresco, to pay it off this fiscal year so that those monies would be available for next fiscal year. So um, they have graciously agreed to be here tonight. So if you have any um, specific questions you'd like to ask them, um, they can explain in further detail. 
Okay. Yeah, Mr. Steele. Or Dr. Chairman? Bracey's yeah. here too. <clears throat> if you could come up real quick. Mine's is simple, but I want to make sure that Sorry, Mr. Dr. Bracey. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the uh, the categories here, as we we settle out, we've had a good year, two years under this new methodology. Is it safe to assume now, by the end of this physical year, that once we've got these numbers in these categories, the fluctuations will be a lot less going forward, or are these one-time opportunities that you'll still see some of the fluctuation? I mean, I understand the technology and things like that. You always need to move some things, but I was more interested in hoping as we move forward with the categories, once we really know where these numbers are going to sit, it should be not rubber stamp, but close to that going forward. Is that a safe assumption or not? I, I, th I think you, you're always going to have changes. Keep in mind that we're making categorical adjustment to a budget that was established in March 2014. This was past the interim superintendent. This was from the old superintendent, our budget. So we're making adjustments to something that was made over 15 months ago. And a lot of things have changed. A lot of people have changed. A lot of the personnel cost factors have changed. So a lot of things have changed. There will be maybe some stabilization going out, but we contend that we'll always require categorical adjustments toward the end of a fiscal year because our original budget plan has been made, you know, more than a year ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I wanted to ask that just to get the information and make sure it's out because if we're going to continue to see that, that's fine. But I don't want – because I kind of thought once we did get in the categories, we'd say, okay, we knew going in how much we wanted for instruction and administration and transportation and all that. And then it'd just be a matter of tweaking as we go forward. Or if you had some type of one-off or an anomaly, then you would do that. But that's not the case. It, it could be or it could not be. It, it could be. And I guess with, with this one, with – I guess, with, well, he was here, but with me not being here at the beginning of the year when everything was planned, as we get to the end, right. and it, and what I didn't want it to seem like we were just spending funds, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make sure that I met with the administration at the school as well as in the, in the office to find out what our specific needs were. Right. So from there, we looked at it, and before we presented it to our board, we had to make sure that we were following the everything with 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 transformation mm -hmm. to make sure that we had the the co-ops or identify the, the MWB to make sure that we could spend the funds. Right. So I think it will level out some because now we'll have an idea of what we want to do going forward within the year and it'll be planned out. But as Mr. Steele stated, there will always be some adjustments when you're dealing with categorical because when you're dealing with um, these are rough estimates and, and we don't know exactly what the, the numbers will be once a project may be bid it out and so forth. So toward the end of the year, we will have this type of uh, dialogue. And I think one of the biggest challenges is you can never overspend your budget, so you've always got to pull quick. back on the yeah. throttle to make sure you you have a safe landing every time. And exactly. so, and if you have too much, you're going to get beat up because you didn't spend it all or you didn't do it. So it's a tough act, and I recognize that, and that's why I wanted to make sure that uh, I at least asked that so it's it's out in the public and they understand it that it, you're always going to have some fluctuation there. I, I think with technology and those type of things, that's no one can ever predict where we're going with that thing. But uh, uh, any other questions for the uh, superintendent or the – oh, yes, ma'am, Vice Mayor. I'd just like to say I'm really pleased um, with this extra $3 million in um, technology and the mm -hmm. iPads and the computers. I mean, that, I think that's where we've all wanted to see our – tax money go and I'm, right. I'm thrilled that you're able to do that. Well, thank you. Yeah. And a lot of it also is with the, the infrastructure within the buildings to make sure that it's, the buildings are wired for the, for the technology that we're bringing in. Good. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Just, uh, can you give us a, a, a overview of the 2.6 and, and, and what, not, not detail, but what it's going to be? On the operation side here. On the operation yeah. side. Mm -hmm. Um. A lot of that includes uh, the boiler over at Norcom. It includes um, some locker and bleacher and security cameras. Uh, there's some HVAC controls that it includes. Um, 
trying to think of a couple others, but uh, the security, the cameras, right? Um, stormwater projects, which actually we're paying the city for to do for us. Uh, a lot of those were on backlog. They were trying to correct some of the flooding issues that were talked about earlier, um, and uh, um, those 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 are the main ones. Okay, that's fine. That's one. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions? Thank you all very much. All right, yep. you're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> any other questions on that? Item? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, the next item is uh, an update on Willett Hall. Um, let me ask Nita if she would come and introduce this. Good evening, Mayor. Hey. Vice Mayor. Never a minute to uh, load the presentation up, but uh, I'm really pleased to uh, provide you guys with an update on Willett Hall. We contracted the Livas Group. We contracted the Livas Group to conduct an evaluation of uh, of Willett Hall, and this started back uh, last year. But before I start, I want to introduce John Spencer who's the principal that we work with from the Livas Group, and also uh, another member of the Livas Group, Bill Milligan. We've worked with them in the past. Okay. Uh, the Livas Group, we selected them because they actually uh, conducted the renovation of the Attucks Theater and the Ogden uh, Hall at Hampton University. Before I turn it over to John, I am going to bring everybody up to speed on the Willett Hall problems. Dennis Bagley, where's Dennis? Dennis? Dennis gave council a presentation back in early 2013, and uh, I'll only take just maybe a couple of minutes to bring everybody up to speed, and then I'll turn it over to uh, John Spencer, who'll give you the details of his evaluation. Okay. As everyone is aware, uh, Bullet Hall has quite a few historical issues. Uh, the main one that, that reached the paper, I think a couple of years back, was the standing water that's under the building. It was designed with that standing water. And uh, as a result, the standing water has severe termite damage. We're actually not able to treat the termites in the building. When we have the swarms, we call our pest management company and they tell us to just get a can of Raid and spray it. At this point in time, when you, they can't put any more um, pesticides in the groundwater because you can't really treat uh, the building because everything is it's water underneath the building. And there are pumps going 24-7 to keep that water pumped out from under the building. Uh, we also need to replace the fire pump for the, pre for the sprinkler system and HVAC replacement as well as roof replacement. Uh, just some pictures of the water underneath the building. You can see that the dark area <coughs> where you see sort of the reflection is the water. And uh, this is just one of many pictures of the termite damage that's occurring. Now, the reason why we decided to conduct a detailed evaluation was because there was a lot of discussion about having, uh, and it came, a lot of it came from the audit as well, we needed to have Broadway plays. We needed to bring better performances into the theater. Uh, we wanted to have symphony and orchestra performances. We wanted to have a lecture series. Uh, and we also wanted to continue to support the local and regional stage performances. But there was another issue as well. We really needed to bring our facilities up to the 21st century. The stage lighting um, and um, the sound system, as, as John Spencer will talk about. But for our patrons, for performers, and for the employees, the amenities are pretty, pretty bleak. So as a part of the evaluation, we uh, began working with the Livers Group in August of, of last year and we we wanted to conduct a thorough evaluation that cost was was prohibitive it was one hundred twenty two thousand dollars we wanted to look at the theater all the way down through water damage remission and control through roofing and termite damage have a thorough assessment done of that building to see what it's really going to cost to bring this building into a and make it a viable venue not just to put a band-aid over it but what is it going to take to make it a viable venue? Because it was so cost prohibitive, we said, okay, let's take a look at what we really, really need and what can we get from regional data as well as from uh, their expertise. 
So on, in December, we decided to just evaluate the theater, and they have a theater consultant that they work with out of New Haven, <coughs> Connecticut. And that consultant is called Next Stage Design, and they're an international theater consultant. So we said, okay, let's contract you guys to work with your theater consultant, and then Livus would use regional data as well as historical data because Dennis had conducted an evaluation of the water. And let's get a total cost of what it's going to take to make this a viable venue, not just stick a Band-Aid on it or not make it pretty and it's still rotting from the bottom out. At this point, I'll turn it over to John Spencer. He's going to talk about exactly the, uh, the details of that study and what they found and what it's going to cost us. Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Good evening, sir. We wanted to take a look at this, and uh, we'll start out looking at some building comparisons. And the reason for this is to have an idea of what your competition is in the area and give you a good idea of what it would take in order to bring this uh, up to where you want it to be. Uh, one of the things we had to keep in mind is we're talking about patron expectations and satisfaction. And if we look at Willard Hall, seating capacity is 1924,924 square footage, 56,000. And the farthest seat from the stage is 110 feet. Chrysler Hall, on the other hand, has a few more seats, larger square footage. We didn't know the farthest seat. Ferguson has less seats uh, and more square footage and they're 120 feet uh, from the edge of the stage. Sandler, you see there, is much smaller. But uh, one of the things we also want to look at is the kind of impressions that you get when you go in, because people have high expectations when they're paying a lot of money for a Broadway show. <coughs> the uh, current entry to uh, Willard Hall, and this is a seating. As you look at that, you can say that doesn't look too bad. But if you look at this, this is Chrysler Hall, which is your closest competition, and this is the interior of Chrysler Hall. Doesn't look too bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is the outside of Ferguson as you approach it, uh, and then this is the inside of Ferguson. Doesn't look too bad either. Too bad either, no. <laughs> and here is Sandler Center, and the interior of Sandler Center, so that you can see that when you pay money to go to one of these vineyards, then you have high expectations when you get, and not just get inside, but it starts outside. So that some of the additional constraints, and let us start looking at it uh, here. Uh, let's start with the uh, parking lot. Uh, you're approximately 250 feet from the front of the building. It's almost 100 yards. Uh, you share parking with the uh, hospital, and there's a conflict there because they will be using it. Uh, Willard Hall would be using it. Uh, but uh, And you need to have a more welcoming uh, feeling as you approach it. The entry and the front of the house, there are issues there. Uh, right now, it's used for circulation, ticketing, concessions, restrooms. Uh, our consultant said that it is significantly deficient in the kinds of facilities that we should have in the uh, entry and the front of the house. Um, there are places where you will have a log jam when you go in for ticketing, and then there is no place there, and I'll mention that as we go down a little further, for the uh, lobby and lounge. Uh, you have no place for pre-performance activities. Uh, when you have your intermission, you don't have the usual uh, activities that can take place at that time. And then when you have the after uh, performances, that's not possible because the space is not there. Uh, <coughs> ADA access uh, and uh, compliance issues are there. Uh, we're short on uh, the number of seats that are required for uh, the uh, handicap. And if you were trying to get anyone up to the second floor, whether in a wheelchair or not, that is uh, difficult because the only way up is by stair. So that uh, really a uh, elevator is uh, needed. Aisle width is in there because in the old uh, building, the aisles start out wide at the back and they narrow as they go down. 
that's against the current code. That would have to be corrected so that they are equal all the way down, allowing equal access so that you can go either way, back, forward, sideways, whatever, in order to get to the exit. To the exit. If any of you are familiar Mr. with... Mr. Spencer, yes. you're saying so from the rear, as I enter into Willard Hall, the aisleway is a little wider. Narrower. As I go toward the stage going down, it gets narrower? Yes, it does. Is that right? I didn't know that. Hmm? Didn't know that <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the, and the pitch going down is something that has to be spoken to. We think that we can get by with the pitch, but we do have to do something about the width. That also has something to do with handicapped access. Mm -hmm. And uh, the number of uh, handicapped seats that are in there need to be increased. Uh, that is one. Uh, balcony access is limited to the stairs. We need an elevator in order to get uh, up and down, to get equipment up and down. Uh, the sound systems and the sound control rooms are on the upper level, and you'd have to have access to that. Uh, the number of restroom facilities is interesting that there are more restroom facilities, or more units for men than for women. It's usually the other way around. Uh, we found in the evaluation that we can probably use the number of facilities that we have for the men. We need to triple the number that we have now for the women. It's just a not there if you plan to keep the same number of seats and to have uh, the kind of facility you're looking for. Seating width and depth, people are wider, seats are wider, spaces between seats uh, is getting deeper. Uh, we feel, however, that we can get by with that, but there is the possibility as we make some of the corrections that we could add some larger seats to accommodate the people who would require them. Um, there is uh, no sound system currently that is being rented, and uh, Broadway shows tend to bring a lot of their stuff, but they expect to have the backup material there as, you, uh, as they come in. Uh, inadequate lecture service, I checked with the MEP people today. Uh, the entry right now is probably sufficient, but once you pass that point, everything on the inside would probably have to be upgraded. Uh, there's uh, inadequate electric service. The b back of the house is one of the problems. It was a theater that was designed for use by high school students. Uh, we don't have the usual facilities that you would have for Broadway shows. That is uh, dressing rooms, green rooms, uh, the restrooms that are required, storage. Uh, you don't have the kind of workroom that you need for the building of sets and all of that kind of thing. So that, and there's also when they have these traveling shows, there are separate facilities for the performers and the crew. So that we would have to duplicate many of the things that are there now as we are bringing them up to date. As you go into the existing restrooms, you really can't get into them. And there's no way that they could be used for handicapped folks. Uh, now you have those, those things exist at the other competitors to Sandler Center at Ferguson, Everything they've all got separate rooms and green rooms and all that in the back? They have all the facilities that are needed to satisfy the Broadway shows as they come in. I've been in, I know that they have green rooms, I, can't, I haven't counted them all, but I have been through them, a couple of them, and I know that they have them. And then, of course, inadequate house lighting, stage lighting, rigging, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, the fire safety curtain, and this is something you might want to address right away. Uh, one probably is uh, currently of asbestos, which is not good, and we don't think it's working at this particular time. So that is something. Some of these things you're going to have to do no matter what. If you continue to exist and don't do anything else, there are some changes that are going to have to be made. You need the new roofing. You need the new HVAC. You need the new electrical update. You need to do something about some of the toilets, and you definitely have to speak to the handicapped. You didn't, you, this electrical piece, you didn't speak to that. It's just that we don't have the proper load or? Your electric entry is good, but a lot of the work in there is old, and so it's going to have to be brought up to date. And the things that are being used at this particular time are going to cause a different drain on the existing uh, um, entry. Uh, for example, the new lighting systems that are going to come in and all of those things. Because right now you don't have the kinds of uh, 
lighting that we uh, should have. The half lighting, <coughs> stage lighting, and all of that is going to have to be... Uh, so if we said do that, then we clearly would have to increase the electrical capacity to be able to accommodate it. Uh, he doesn't think so at this particular moment. Does not. He okay. thinks that because it was just done a few years ago. Okay. What about for the HVAC? For the HVAC, we've not looked at that at this particular point, but we're hoping that all of that with the new service that was brought in a few years ago, that there's enough capacity to cover the changes. But uh, that will be a part of the additional study. This study did not cover lighting those things. We just looked at it to tell you what the requirements are going to be, what it is you're going to need. So. Now, here is uh, some of our results in terms of square footage uh, analysis. Uh, if you look at the existing square feet, the front of the house and look at the go down 7,800 square feet, we're going to renovate 7,800, but we want to build new 7,120 for the new total. And the reason for that is that for all of the things that you're going to need in terms of uh, new office space, etc., you're going to have to use or add to and add to the building as it exists, which means that we looked at the one-story addition that is attached to the building with the idea that some of that would be demolished and some of it would be retained and then we would add to that. So that that's would, the rear, the one-story, that that's the old gymnasium, I mean the band room. Uh, well, I think that there were classrooms down there yeah, okay. and uh, really it's good. along the side and around the back. Yeah, so that there are classrooms, there is a mechanical room, and then there is the band room that is on the back. But those would all be either demolished or rehab. Most of the restoration is going to take place along the back. The new stuff is going to take place on the side. It will be the left-hand side as you go in. Now, a lot of that has to be done because as you go down to the lower left-hand corner at the stage, you go down the stairs in order to go out. But there, there is a difference in level. Once you get out there, you're in the corridor for the old room. There's no exit from there. So that, that is a fire hazard that would have to be spoken to. Okay. So if we look at all of the existing square footage, we're rehabbing 110 on the uh, for renovate, 18,000. Add uh, rehabbing, but nothing new. Stage support, we're adding uh, nothing new, but we are renovating and rehabbing uh, some there. The amount goes up. Performer support, we are going to renovate, but we're adding or rehabbing really 1,200 square feet. Multipurpose room is one that has to be used to help satisfy the performers and can be used, of course, when there's no performance there. And that's going to be a new 2,500 square feet. Administration, you see that a lot of that is rehab. For a total, the existing 31,000, when you go across, by the time you do renovations, rehabbing, and addition, it ends up at 45,000. In the abandoned area, we've not changed. Um, total there, 41,000, ends up at 45. But when we get through the total gross square footage, existing is 56,000 square feet we will end up at 65,000 square feet, which will be able to handle all of the things that we've been talking about. In order to give you some idea of what the cost might be, uh, the remediation of water has been in there for some time. That is a figure we're going from a low to a high. We're using anywhere from, uh, I think we said 250 per square foot up to about 300, a little bit better and to 250 to 350 per square foot so that we have the cost of water remediation, cost of renovation and rehab and new construction. We have the cost of changes to the stage and the theater. This comes out of the report. These are theater stage changes, not anything to do with the rest. That's just for the stage and its equipment. A contingency of 10 to 15 percent <coughs> and then A&E for 8 uh, to 10 percent. So that a rough budget estimate, estimates, low at about 24,008, high 
24 million, excuse me, eight. <laughs> Wish you could get it for 24 million, eight. Uh, you can't buy a car for 24,000. Okay. And then uh, 33 million for uh, high uh, using the uh, 350 uh, per square foot. This does not include site work and uh, any of the additional parking that would be needed, landscaping, and all of that kind of thing. Just out of curiosity, did we ever look at what it would cost to to nuke that thing and build a new one? Nita? Yes, we, uh, there's one more slide that I, I had here, and I'm not sure why it's not coming up. Um, we wanted to talk about, and that was actually the decision points, and that's where we, this is where we get yeah. to next. Uh, and thank you, John. I appreciate it. Yeah. And what, when, when John had mentioned earlier about what it's going to take just to bring the current building up to a, a state of good repair, it's going to be about $15 million. That's not with any of the upgrades, any of the renovation work. It's about $15 million with the things we really need to do. Uh, and so we, we are at a decision point at this, this, this point in time. Um, do, we keep it as is. We repair it. The bottom of that bucket is $15 million just to have what we currently have in a good state of repair, the roof, HVAC, okay, and getting rid of some of the fire issues. Or do we close the facility? Uh, the next option to consider long term is do we move forward with a design professional for repair and upgrade? We can go back and give Live Us the rest of that $122,000 for him to come back and specifically tell us what the load needs to be, but we figured for the 32000 and the estimate on the theater and the detailed analysis with the theater, with the, with the regional estimates and his expertise in building assessment, we, we felt like 32000 was an initially good investment. But we can go back and have them to complete the rest of the evaluation to get back to the same point. Um, well, we, I, I think I'm concerned, and I think right. we, we, we expressed a concern about a year ago when Dennis made a... A, a swag at what you just just narrowed in a little to be able to invest and put these type of dollars into the current design with the standing water and all of that uh, I think that would be a terrible mistake I just I just don't know if we want to go and pump in 20 or 30 million dollars and we've still got this and I don't know what other system we could install with that water there without putting in some well points and pumping all that out and coming up with some other more solid design because you put that money in there, you're still going to be faced with that that dampness and all of that uh, 10 years down the road and and none of us will probably be here then, but somebody's going to be frowning on, well, I guess I'll speak for myself, <laughs> but, but, but uh, <laughs> frowning upon that, that amount of money there. So I'm concerned with the core issue is the foundation and the design concept that that building was built under and that standing water and constant movement. And, and until that's addressed and we get that under some type of, uh, Mr. Spencer, and I don't know if you've got even looked at that, that standing water and how it was designed, the honeycomb design. And, I mean, we went through a whole gyration of that. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure you didn't crawl under there, but. Uh, <laughs> no. but, but this is a big issue, man. I, I, I agree with everything you said. But if I, if I heard Ms. Joseph right, we're all, the termites are always going to be there. Until you get rid of the water, the termites will right. be so, there. So, because our company, our, they, they won't even treat it. So why would I spend fifteen million dollars to think still have termites? Right. Yeah. I, well, if I could speak to yes, sir. Uh, your yeah, question, yeah, I know uh, I have not been under that building, and I'm not terribly familiar with the system that we're talking about. But we did have that kind of problem. We did the dining hall on the Hampton University campus, and that's fairly recent. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there are methods that we use now for waterproofing, for pumping systems that go around the perimeter of the building mm -hmm. to carry the water away from it. So I, you know, I'm not going to uh, put my head on the chopping block <laughs> at this moment mm -hmm. and say uh, that we can do it. But I think it can be done. But there is a cost that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. 
so that we would have to investigate that and see right. whether the five million that's in there will cover it or whether there's additional funds required. I, I think you told us enough. I don't, we don't need to spend that other that, that right. the rest yeah, of the no. time. There's, there's one other thing too. We talked with IMG, who's the contractor that the promoter that handles uh, Intellos, and we said, okay, if we went out for bid because their contract expires when next year. Uh, this, year, this year, this year, we said if we if we go out for bid and we added Willett Hall to the, the grand scheme of things, things for Intellos and 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 have someone promote Willett Hall, would you guys even bid on it? Then they basically said no, we would not want Willett Hall primarily because not just because of the facility, but it lacks the synergy. It's hard to get to. The location is not the greatest location. It should be in a downtown location where it's it's easily accessible. Uh, he's, and they just said no. We would not. We would not want to promote that venue just because of the location, even if it were perfect. The synergy is not there. Maybe we should include it in next year's bid, so they won't bid on it. Go ahead, Elizabeth. I, I think this is a question for Mr. Spencer. If, if we didn't have any facility of this nature right now. And we we came to you and said, you know, we think we'd like to have a a Ferguson type facility. And here we are in Portsmouth, we got Chrysler Hall across the river. It, it seems I know Willett has a lot of sentimental value to folks and it and it supposedly has the best acoustics in the region and this great stage you can put an elephant in. But would would you say yes, Portsmouth? You should build a 1,900-seat theater, or would you say you know a 1,000-seat theater would be great, or a 500-seat theater would be great for the for if, where Portsmouth is located are, relative to the others? If you're trying to do Broadway shows, then you're going to need somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,900 to 2,000 seats. That's what your competition has all around. That's the size that sells very well. So that you would need something of that nature, okay. and the cost would be between two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars per square foot, not including parking. Mm -hmm. How old is what it all? In the fifties, I think. Still in the fifties. Yeah. It's sixty-eight years old. Sixty-eight years old. <coughs> and so yeah, when think, we now, Dennis, I, I see you over there. It's kind of a minute. And when we. <coughs> brought this thing up we were not aware of the design and the foundation and we were all <coughs> running around chicken little we got water underneath here nobody knows where the leak was we thought it was a sprung and then we looked into it and it was designed for that and that was acceptable at that time right that's correct and that and so the water is standing or is it slowly moving it's the water table when the water table changes the water level under the building changes and, and it's my understanding, um, when the building was built, what they did was uh, they, they, because there was peat at, uh, and, and the geo evaluation showed that was peat at like 15 feet, 16 feet, they dug material out, built the building on it, so they took some of the weight off the ground, so the building weight would take up the material <coughs> that they removed. That meant the water, the, the level under the building was much lower than it is outside of the building. Then they built the building on top of it. Well, when the water table began to rise and, and go down, I mean, you can measure that on a daily basis and it changes depending on where the water table is. And we've got pumps under there now running and they run 24 hours a day and they, the water still stands under the building because it's, it's groundwater. And we originally gave you three options. Uh, uh, we had McPherson uh, uh, structural engineers come in along with the GO folks, and they gave us three options. One was to sheet pile completely around the building down. I, I'm, I'm trying to go on memory. It was 25, 30 feet in the ground, uh, so they, they would get below the water table, and they would sheet pile around the whole entire building to kind of isolate it from the remainder of the ground. And we pump that water out, and that way it be... Once you pump it out, the sheet pile would keep it from coming back in, and you, it would be dry under the building. But the cost of that, the estimated cost was, and I'm, again, I'm going on memory, but it was about $20 million, $25 million to do that. They gave us another option, which was to go in and put flowable fill in. But because of that honeycomb design and some of the places you can't get into, there was no guarantee that that flowable fill would be able to go into those areas. So the final option that they gave us, and it was right in the five, uh, five million dollar neighborhood, was to go in and cut holes all inside the building and go inside of each one of those and fill them with sand until they got up above the water table. And that would eliminate the water coming up above uh, ground level.
Now, at its highest point, how far is the water from the bottom of the foundation or the floor? Well, it's. I mean, it's if you get what, what's your clearance there at, at worst case? The, the 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 theater itself is like a bathtub. It's a it's just a concrete bathtub, and where we have the biggest problems with water intruded inside the building is when it gets up about six foot, seven foot underneath the building. There's a square opening in the in the uh, prop room that's under the stage, and then the water will flow over, and then it'll come inside the building. And when that's happened twice in my career here, for 25 years, so. Um, typically that doesn't happen, but everything around the stage stays saturated, and that's where the moisture problem comes into play, and that's why the termites are there. And the, 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 uh, our uh, termite uh, pest control people, so they just can't pump chemicals into that ground because it just flows everywhere and they have no control over it. So uh, we've uh, relegated to treating them with spray when they begin to swarm and, and that's pretty much our only option yeah. at this point until we can get rid of that water. Then we can treat the ground and get rid of the termites but it's a huge investment and you know, we, we need some direction on right. how we'd like to move forward with it. But uh, now Mr. Spencer you talked about the pitch and you think we could stay with the pitch we had if we were to bring that up with uh, especially with the water table and the height that would give us a better chance um, from a, a moisture perspective, or I mean, because it sounds like we I just need to tear it I think the problem up. when we had talked about it, you were going to resolve that by adding an additional additional square footage along on the, the side, side yes. so that the because the pitch is too steep for uh, for ADA compliance. So you'd have to add additional square footage and then bring people who are in wheelchairs down through that new square footage to the bottom floor. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, a facility you had over at Hampton University. Hampton, Portsmouth, all of us have these same water issues. What system do you have over there, and how are you how are you maintaining the water piece with the facility? Are you moving it, pumping? We've got pumps running 24 hours a day. Same concept, or? Uh, right now, and uh, you may know where the dining hall is located, right there on the uh, front of the uh, river, right, uh, yeah. maybe 25 uh -huh. feet or so from uh, the river's edge. But uh, when we poured the concrete, there was an admixture that was put in that uh, guaranteed <coughs> it gets wet, it expands, and it keeps the water out. So that uh, we did a lot of pumping and everything in the beginning to keep the water out there, cleared the site, and as we poured the concrete, we actually made a waterproof. A barrier. A barrier. Okay. There are uh, things on the market now that they say you can put on from the inside uh, for buildings that are already in place. I've only tried them a couple of times so that I'm not uh, you know, familiar. <coughs> saying we're just waiting to see how well they work. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any and other then questions? just the last two items uh, I had here was. You know, if we wanted to move forward, we could look. I don't know how much debt we can take on to do a renovation, or we can revisit our strategy for Willett Hall. Do we look at somewhere closer downtown uh, to have an entertainment venue, and do we look at maybe uh, a different purpose for the Willett Hall site altogether? So that's pretty much the presentation. The decision. Where we okay. Did. Yep. All right. Any other questions? No. I think we probably, I don't think Want we to need to go any further with them looking at anything else until we come to grips with the well, fundamental issue here with that facility. Okay. I, anybody else? I agree. Okay. Thank you. And just know that we have funding for operations and funding for very basic maintenance for the upcoming year, and that's what we've been doing for the last several years. And there's only so many <coughs> years we can continue to do that, but mm -hmm. that's what we at least have through the end of um, next fiscal year, FY16. Okay. Yes. Um, can you give us, uh, remind me please, the status of the virtual bridge, where we are on the Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I had queued James up. James, <laughs> if you would uh, come to the podium <laughs> to talk about a couple issues if we had time tonight. Churchill Bridge was one, Turnpike Road was the other, and then the latest on the seawall. So sure. um, we have a little bit of time. So. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Member of City Council. I'm going to start off with a quick update on the seawall. Um, as you know, last week we closed down the portion of the seawall between the two inlets while we're completing our underwater inspection. 
Um, that inspection should be completed by the end of the month. We've uh, looked at that Admiral's Landing Renaissance piece. We've looked at the piece from High Street Landing down to City Hall. Now we're down there looking at the old Holiday Inn piece. Um, the preliminary results from that City Hall section looks like we may have to close that down until we can come to some decisions about how we want to go about addressing the things we find in this report. Um, we're currently, uh, city along with our design team and our underwater inspectors, are sorting through those inspection results um, and we're examining emergency repair options and we're also altering our current design schedule so that we can incorporate some of these change conditions <laughs> and sort of make the best use of our funds and incorporate as much of the emergency repair as we can to that final design. And we're also uh, keeping in mind what these impacts are going to be to the overall budget for the project. And also we've got a, um, some of our design professionals that have experience with this underwater kind of work looking to see if there are any other type of funding available, whether it be federal, FEMA, what, what have you. So we're looking at all options right now. Um, with that, I'll take any questions on the city wall. What was the fix uh, to the section that we did right there by Admiral's Landing about a year or so ago? Was it just as simple as going in and adding some new pylons underneath for stability, or was it a corrosion-resistant piece? Or what do we do in that piece, and why can't we just do the same thing in these other areas? Um, we have looked at that, and I'll uh, ask Yusuf to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because what I'm thinking, we didn't get one section. We know what we did to put a, a fix on it. Uh, why are we doing more evaluations on what to fix? I mean, I can see we need to look at how bad the corrosion is and all of that, but we already know what the fix is because we've done a section of it, correct, Yusuf? Yes, sir. Correct. We're trying to determine the extent of how much we'll have to replace and how soon right now. Mm -hmm. and, um, like I said, these are change conditions from our last inspection report two years ago. Uh -huh. um, that last inspection report said um, Holiday Insight, Admiral's Landing Renaissance piece, City Hall piece. This new inspection says Admiral's Landing Renaissance piece, City Hall piece, Holiday Inn piece. And so that, that's a change condition over the past two years, and we're just trying to figure out the best way to approach these. And that repair that was done prior to is the primary option on the table right now. But we're looking at all options. Okay, what was that repair? If you can brief us real quick, what did we do? We, we and how much life did we gain on this? The life expectancy of the repair that we did um, is about 50 years uh, plus with the proper maintenance. Uh, we did um, we did um, new sheeting sheet piles and uh, new battered piles with that design. Uh, we based it on the older, on the old design that we had in there, and uh, at that at that time the old piles had rusted out um, at the mud line, mm -hmm. and um, w after the failure we repaired it in kind and we used different kind of steel and. Um, Hopefully it will last a little longer with the proper maintenance. It's a little bit beefier section. A little beefier section. Yes. Sir. Now, how long was that section? About 120 feet. 100, about 120 feet. And what did we spend on that repair? About 1.2 million. One. About 1.2 million. 1.1, 1.2. Okay. All right. So we could. Are we looking close in that same price range? I know that's been a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm not sure. The original estimate for replacement from the Holiday Inn down down to here was about 20 million. From the Holiday Inn all the way down? All, all the way down. Right, but yes, we're not going to bite this whole elephant. No, we weren't planning on right. biting it all. We were designing it all together so we could do as much mm -hmm. as possible with the funding available to get some sort of economies of scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, How long this, did this that first batch take? In. How long did it take us to do that first piece? Uh, a couple of months, two, two and a half months or so. About two and a half months. Okay. So if we were to break this up, and I think the first initial diagram that we got had it broken up into different sections that we could probably take down a section, do that same repair. And you say we're gaining about 50 years on the life side? At least. At least. So with maintenance. Yes. But, yeah, if we could break it down in those 150-foot sections to to bite off, if we're only talking a couple of million at a per Hundred and foot, fifty foot section. Then that's what we're looking at right now. Okay. At that time, it costed a little extra because we had a failure. Okay. With this now, we don't have a failure yet. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, it will be a little less. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we, we do have that programmed in the CIP. <clears throat> we we do have two years of, if I remember correct, three years of uh, 
of improvements in the CIP for the three years of improvements, meaning we can do. I there should be about six point five, maybe seven million once you go to once, over those three once years. Once the CIP is for uh, this, because that's what we're targeting the design. So for. six or seven million. You're talking another three hundred and fifty foot sections. We've already got into the CIP. It's just a matter of what doing it. Potentially, based on preliminary estimates, you could potentially, if this emergency repair doesn't done come up with a crazy number, you could do that. You could do that piece that's blocked off right now. Okay. Potentially. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You got no, something? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> Church and Bridge. Oh, but, excuse me. Who did that work on that first piece? Uh, it was uh, Crofton. Crofton Dive. Crofton Dive. Crofton. Okay. What's my company? Yep, that's a portion of company here. <laughs> Okay, um, in the proposed VDOT six-year improvement uh, program, we received $8.2 million in funding from the state. It's all state funds, no federal ties. Um, at the same time, uh, VDOT has also recommended approval of our current revenue sharing application, which that is for uh, $5 million from the state. The state would have a $5 million match. So uh, coming out of this year's uh, state budget is about eight point eighteen point two million dollars in approved funding which leaves our project approximately three million dollars short we just received comments back from VDOT on our 60 percent plans so we'll uh, work at the design team to address those comments our next step will be the uh, design public hearing where the public will get a chance to look at the design make comments uh, also look at the environmental document um, it's, an, uh, it's an official uh, public meeting, so there will be court reporters uh, taking, taking minutes and notes, and there's a formal response that we actually provide back to all the citizens that make comments. Uh, they're all part of the record, and they go back. Once we when get is that, that, when is that, when is that? We haven't set that date yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to get those comments back on a 60% plan before they'll give us to go ahead for, for that advertisement. It'll be a public meeting most likely at TCC campus, uh, similar to what we've done for some of our other large projects. Um, then it'll move into the right-of-way clearance phase. There are three to five properties that are going to be affected. There were some small right-of-way takes just because the bridge is going to be a little wider because of the bike lane and some of the other federal requirements. Um, there are two to three more VDOT reviews, and so we're looking at construction sometime uh, towards the first part of FY17 and two years for construction. Um, I'll take any questions. And you say we were short how much? About a million? About three million. About three million short. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's for the 60% match? That is for total project fund. Total project fund, and that's all in on our, our part? Okay. Um, part from the state, part from us. So there's, there's a pretty good chunk of state money on the project right now. Yeah, but we got to belly up we another belly three up. million. Okay. Well, we, have we could do revenue sharing for that three million, and they pick up 1.5, and we pay the other 1.5. Or that's still a viable option. Okay, that's what I was asking. Okay, hey, last update. Um, Turnpike Road, um, that project will be starting next, uh, on June 1st, so sometime next week. I forget which day that is. Uh, VDOT had their contractor ready to go. That contractor is E.V. Williams. Um, it's a $23.4 million project. Um, it extends from Dixie Avenue, which is that street right behind the CVS, down to Constitution. Um, you're going to end up with a two, that two-lane railway will be widened to four lanes, with the center turn lane, sidewalks, curb, and gutter. All the public utilities in that corridor are going to replace water, sewer, the 24-inch HRSD main. Um, there's uh, substantial storm drainage um, that will be uh, replaced. Um, the work will occur in phases. The first phase is from Constitution to Meander. The second phase is from Meander to Romanesque. The uh, next phase is from Romanesque to Phillips then from Phillips to Howard, from Howard to Frederick, and then from Frederick to Dixie. Um, there will be full closures up until uh, the point where it gets to Howard. Once it gets to Howard Street, there's a lot of coordination that will have to occur between the Kroger, uh, the, I forget the name of the, name of the housing uh, that's right there. Seaboard Square. Seaboard Square, mm -hmm. and the proposed, whatever proposed development is going to go in, and so then once you get through that intersection right there, so those won't be full closures. There will be some sort of modified uh, lane closures with detours. But that'll be on the tail end of the that'll project. Be that'll be and we're looking at starting this when? June 1st? June 1st. Uh, down the, by Frederick Boulevard by what time? Be towards the end, um, probably within the last six months. And this project is anticipated to be complete 
uh, in May 2018. 2018. And we're crossing Frederick and going to the street just behind the CVS. That's where the end point is for that phase of the point. Make sure you coordinate Frederick with, with, with St. Mark. Okay. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I got a note down here. <laughs> but by 2018, the stuff on 264 from the MLK expansion should be finished, right? It should be. The, they should be, the last piece of that should be rehabbing the existing Midtown Tunnel. That should be just about complete. It'll be somewhere in that in that same time. That's 2018 deadline to. Okay. Okay. Right. Another question. Okay. Okay. Where we can build a new building? Okay. Uh, Mr. Manager, while we're on projects, can we get an update on the behavioral healthcare building? Where we are, uh, we don't need to do it tonight. But I noticed we we slipped some dates, and That's I keep it. riding by and thinking the lights are going to stay on and they keep going out and I know that doing a windshield drive isn't a fair assessment but we need to get a okay. firm update on that facility and, that. and you might check back through your memos I think we sent one out about two or three weeks ago the, the key delay right now has to do with the um, um, the masonry mm -hmm. exterior um, there's some problems with it and uh, we want to get it right before we accept it but uh, we'll we'll pull that memo out, update it, and see if there's anything that we can get okay. you and, and get. And it outside out. of that, anything else that need to be done? So once we do get that piece done, we can start the process of uh, of moving into that facility. Oh, yes. I mean, it's 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 actually the, the 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 office equipment, all the all the interior equipment is done, and it's you know it's ready uh, to be moved into. We just need to make sure that we're we've got the exterior in, a, in an acceptable. Mm -hmm condition before we accept it okay all right anybody else anything else That's right. okay all right Madam Clerk. you have a motion for a closed meeting mm -hmm. I move to go to close the meeting pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711 to discuss the award of public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, including interviews of bidders or offers, and discussion of terms of the scope of such contract, where discussion in the open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. Second. <coughs> Mr. Cherry? Yes. Dr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Meeks is absent. Mr. Moody is absent. Ms. Simmons? Yes. Dr. Whitaker? Yes. Mayor Wright? Yes. We are enclosed. Thank you. Thank you.